Good morning, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Lab 207 Webcast. My name is Mr. Kite, and I'll be hanging out with you today as we wrap up our series on energy resources. Final topic to talk about is fuel cells and the future. So like always, let me get you some objectives, and we'll get going. By, this, by the end of this video, be able to explain the operation and function of a hydrogen fuel cell, discuss the challenges associated with renewable energy. So that's what we got. We've been talking for the last, I don't know, five or eight videos about non-renewable energy sources, then renewable energy sources. Now we're going to talk about what it's going to take to move on into a sustainable future. So let's go ahead and jump on in. First thing I want to talk about is emerging technologies. And this is really kind of where we stand at the moment. There is new technology cropping up all the time. Most of that new technology allows us to use energy more efficiently. But unfortunately, some of the new technology means that we consume more energy. So as we move on into the future, the hope is that these emerging technologies will be the technologies that ultimately is going to help humankind to consume and produce energy in a way that is less damaging to the environment. So let's jump on in and look at a couple of technologies that you should be aware of. The fuel, first one is a fuel cell. A fuel cell is like a battery, but better. So in a traditional battery, you've got metals interacting with each other in a closed container to produce electricity that can be used to do work. In a fuel cell, You've got a similar chemical reaction going on except for the container is open and you can continually add material to it. That material undergoes chemical reactions, it produces electricity, and then byproducts are given off. Um, for our purposes today, we're going to talk about a hydrogen fuel cell where hydrogen is the input. Hydrogen interacts with oxygen within that fuel cell in order to produce electricity, and then the output is water. So rather than me just talking about it, let me kind of show you how it works. So this is a hydrogen fuel cell right here. And up there at the top of the picture, you can see the basic diagram of how this thing works. Within the fuel cell, you've got a semi-permeable membrane. This membrane is permeable only to protons. So what you do is you've got a tank of compressed hydrogen gas. That hydrogen gas is pressed up against the reaction layer. When it gets to the reaction layer, the H2 gas gets split up into two hydrogens that are separate. When it is split up, the protons are pushed through the membrane. The electrons are split off. These electrons flow up and around and down to the other side of the membrane. On the other side of the membrane, oxygen is added into the system. These electrons that are coming down, the protons that are coming across, and the oxygen that has just come in form water, and then that water comes out the tailpipe. Now, the flow of these electrons up and around is the electricity that can be harvested to do work. So within the application of a car, here's basically what it would look like. You've got your hydrogen cylinders under the back seat or in the trunk area. Those contain compressed hydrogen gas. You've got an inlet for oxygen from the outside. So you've got your hydrogen coming in. you got your oxygen coming in into the fuel stack. The fuel stack is the place where your membrane and the reaction occurs. So within the fuel stack right here, electricity is made. That electricity is fed to an electric motor, which drives the wheels, and then the byproduct that is given off is water. So that's essentially how a fuel cell works, or a hydrogen fuel cell works, at least. Now, there are advantages and disadvantages of a fuel cell. Now, obviously, the advantages are you are putting in hydrogen, you are getting out water, so in terms of greenhouse gases, not much to talk about there. Um, another advantage is the fact that electric motors, and we'll talk about this more in a second, but electric motors are just by the way that they're designed more efficient than uh, fossil fuel motors. So this looks like a really good system. You put in hydrogen, you get out water, no pollution, it's really um, efficient. Just like with everything else, there are some drawbacks. So first one is producing hydrogen gas is an energy intensive process. Hydrogen usually bonds to things really tightly, so splitting off that hydrogen is a difficult thing to do. So some opponents argue that it takes more fossil fuel energy to produce hydrogen gas than you actually save by using a hydrogen fuel cell. So that would be one drawback. Another problem is storage. Hydrogen is an explosive thing. So if you were to compress a bunch of hydrogen gas and put it into high pressure tanks in the back of a car, you have essentially produced a bomb that if one of those hydrogen tanks were to leak and then a spark were around, the whole car would go up like the Hindenburg. So major uh, problems with hydrogen fuel cells is that it's energy intensive 
and that hydrogen gas is highly volatile. So as with everything else we've talked about in this series, there are benefits and there are disadvantages. Looking forward though, the electric vehicle <clears throat> looks like the direction that we are headed. Now, currently, you know, there are plug-in electrics. You've got Mitsubishi's version, there's the Chevy Volt, there's the Tesla cars. All of these are cars that you plug into the wall to charge up at night. Once they're charged, they can run anywhere from 75 to 300 miles on a charge of electricity. Now, the reason that this choice is potentially more efficient is, like I mentioned a, a moment ago, um, when it comes to converting energy into work, electric motors are much more efficient than a fossil fuel powered motor. A fossil fuel powered motor, motor may convert like 20 or 30 percent of the energy of that gasoline into actual work within a car. An electric motor may be upwards of 60 to 80 percent efficient, where, you know, 60, 80, 60 to 80 percent of the energy that goes in is actually converted to useful work for driving that vehicle. So it looks like if the infrastructure is put into place, electric vehicles are where we're headed. Now, there are considerations to make about the source of the electricity. Some people will argue that if you are using coal-fired power plants to make the electricity that's driving your electric vehicle, is it really that much more efficient or that much better for the environment? And other people argue, but wait, you can get that electricity from renewable sources of energy. I mean, you could conceivably have a solar panel on top of your garage that charges your electric car. So when we talk about electric vehicles, the source of the electricity is one consideration that needs to be taken into account. As we look towards the future, there are many challenges in place. Presently, a fully renewable portfolio option portfolio isn't an option just yet. And this is for a couple of reasons. One is the problem of storage. We talked about batteries not being efficient for storing energy and most of our renewable sources of energy um, are only generated when the wind is blowing or when the sun is shining or something like that. So we have not gotten to a place yet where we could fully pull back from fossil fuels because we still need a way to either store or generate electricity in the evening time. Also, due to political climates, um, fossil fuels are still cheaper than renewable energy sources, though people are working towards making renewable energy more, um, I guess, cost efficient and more prevalent, but the fight to do that is a difficult one. So we're not yet at a place where we can get to a renewable energy portfolio. Hopefully in the future through the improvement of technology and political will, we can get there. We're going to wrap up our series on this, and the, that is the grid. Um, the grid is the series of lines that takes power from a power plant to the consumer. Currently, our electrical grid is old. It was built, geez, my guess is going to be wrong. It was built before the 1950s, I'll tell you that much. And so it is an aging infrastructure. And right now, the way it basically works is you have large power plants in certain locations. Those power plants produce loads and loads of electricity, then they send it out all across the power lines to your house. Problem with the system that we have now is that it is prone to being um, overrun by capacity. The areas that have the greatest capability for generating renewable energy have the least grid infrastructure tied to them. There are lots of places in our country where the demand exceeds what the grid is able to supply. So there are a lot of problems with our current system of distributing electricity. Also, our current system is a one-way system in that a power plant produces the electricity, sends it to the consumer, the consumer uh, consumes what they need, and then the rest just kind of disappears down the line. So it's a one-way system. A lot of people are proponents of moving to a smart grid. A smart grid is a grid that is all about two-way communication between the power company and the home. There are some key components of a smart grid that you kind of need to know about. Basically, here's what it looks like. Within the smart grid, you've got two-way communication, like I said. So homes would be outfitted with a couple of technologies. There would be a smart meter. That smart meter would tell the family that lives in the house how much electricity they are using. They also would talk back to the power company and show how much electricity was needed at that point in time. Within this house, there are also smart technologies that allow two-way communication like a thermostat or smart appliances. What these appliances would essentially do is they would have computers on board that would allow the consumer and the power company to talk back and forth about when it is best to use these appliances. So a power company could set up a situation where uh, Electricity costs less when there is less demand and more when there is more demand. So a person could go to bed and before they go to bed, they could program their smart dishwasher to say, 
run overnight when the power is the cheapest. So when the demand went down and the price went down, that would trigger the smart appliance to kick on and it would run and the person would get up and they'd have clean dishes. The benefit for this is that for the consumer, they are having lower bills and using electricity, less electricity because their appliances are running when the electricity is the cheapest. For the power company, it's good because it stabilizes demand. Rather than having everybody getting home, eat cooking dinner, running the dishwashers around 8 p.m. at night, and so there's a big spike in the energy use, that demand is spread out throughout the day, which means that they need to have less capacity, it means that they have to run fewer power plants, and they can run more efficiently overall. Now, this type of system also demands that um, the power generation be decentralized. So rather than having big giant power plants, it might look like smaller energy parks scattered around the country. And each part of energy generation could include multiple sources of power generation and serve, you know, a couple thousand people rather than, you know, seven or eight million people. So looking towards a smart grid, we're looking at a system that involves two-way communication and the ability for consumers to communicate with the power company, power company to communicate with the consumer with the eye towards using less electricity. And in the end, it's all going to come down to cost and technology. The only way that we are going to be able to move into a sustainable power future is if the cost of technologies comes down. As we implement more technologies, those technologies become cheaper. So the more we use solar power, the cheaper it's going to become to use solar power. Same for wind or geothermal or the smart grid or anything like that. The problem is overcoming that initial barrier where the adoption of technologies is expensive and difficult. But at some point, you've got to jump in and adopt those technologies before those technologies will come down in price. So as long as we are scared to jump in and adopt new technologies, we're going to be stuck on a... Uh, fuel energy that is dependent on non-renewable fossil fuels. As the country and politics and business move towards and beyond fossil fuels, we're going to see the price of renewables come down and hopefully we'll move towards a more sustainable energy future. And that being said, I'm done talking. Thanks for joining us on the Lab 207 webcast. My name is Mr. Kite. Hopefully we'll see you again.